Hello everybody and welcome to the Alien vs Predator Galaxy podcast. I'm regular host Aaron Percival aka Corporal Hicks and this is episode 102. Now I'm going to be the only familiar voice today uh, for the regular listeners. Instead I've sacked off Ridgetop, I've sacked off Eric and uh, I'm joined by a special guest instead. If you're watching on YouTube you'll see him on the screen and you'll see my beautiful face on the screen as well. And if you're listening, you'll hear his voice shortly. Now, this is Scott Siegler. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you for having me on. And why, why are we on? Should we, should we tell people why you're on? Absolutely, it's talk, yes. <laughs> it's to talk about this beauty here. Well, I say beauty that we have problems with Titans covers, but inside <laughs> it, the words are phenomenal. So, Scott, you are the author of Aliens Phalanx. Yes. Yes. And also Dangerous Prey from Bug Hunt. Yeah, that was a super fun story to write, yeah. And we'll be, we'll be talking about that as well in here. Um, this is going to be full of specifics, full of spoilers. So as always, when it comes to our interviews with the, uh, the authors and, and the creatives, please make sure you've read this first before you listen to it. I mean, the first... Um, third or so of my questions aren't related to this anyway so if you want to learn a bit more about Scott and uh, about her dangerous prey um, then feel free to listen through but I'll throw an extra warning in when we're about to start talking um, phalanx cool. Cool, cool, cool. And, if you, and if you haven't read it for some reason go fucking buy it because this is <laughs> one of the, uh, my favourite one of the best alien novels we've had so um, yeah go go buy it Yes, I concur. Go buy it. Thank you for that. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> no worries. Thank, thanks for making it something I like. <laughs> it's always appreciated. Um, but first of all, you know, again, thank you for taking the time to come and chat to me today. Um, we always really appreciate it. Uh, but before we do start to nerd out about Phalanx, could you tell us a little about Scott Siegler outside of Aliens? You know, who are you? What do you do? And do you have any major interests, uh, any other major interests than Aliens? Uh, Obviously an author, so my primary interest is writing. I write in the kind of sci-fi military, military thriller horror space. So my work is a bit cross genre, not too dissimilar from, uh, from the movie Aliens itself. We bring a lot of different influences in. I podcast most of my work. It used to be all of my work, but some things like this I'm not allowed to podcast. And you can find that at iTunes, search for Scott Sigler Audiobooks, or just search for Scott Sigler in any podcatcher. And we give away free unabridged fiction every Sunday. Um, there's a lot of free books of mine up on iTunes as well, serialized audiobooks with ads inserted between each episode. So free books. We get paid a little bit. Everybody wins. Find all the info about me at scottsigler.com. And please add me. And on Instagram, I'm at scottsigler. On Twitter, at scottsigler. And we've got a pretty good, vibrant Facebook community, facebook.com slash scottsigler. Uh, as far as interests go, uh, pretty much all I do is write and create. My sole break from that is I play bass in uh, uh, I play bass guitar. Right now, my band is Evan Diamond in the Library. You can find out more about that at evandiamondmusic.com or go hear the stuff. Search for Evan Diamond on Spotify, etc. That's my big escape from the writing. Other than doing that for a few hours a week, I'm pretty much always at the keyboard. Full time writer, then. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. And uh, all those links and any, anything mentioned, I'll be sure to bang on the um, the post for the episode as well. I just make it easier for folk to, to click to follow. Um, if you could write another franchise that wasn't Alien, is there any dream properties that you'd like to get involved with? Not really. I'm way backed up on my own properties and I have so much stuff that I want to get right. to. We actually had to uh, carve out room to write the Aliens book. So I've never really been interested in writing in other people's worlds uh, until this project came along. Um, when first when Bug Hunt, Jonathan Mayberry, the editor of Bug Hunt, asked me to be in that, I was like, oh, hell yes, I'll do that. Uh, and that turned into Phalanx, so that led toward Phalanx. So getting to see my name on an official Aliens property was huge for me. Other than that, not too much. Sometimes... Right. Little projects come up here and there, and you, you grab them if they're short stories, but I can't imagine writing a novel in another universe. Okay, fair enough. Um, so it's actually become something of a tradition on the podcast that when we get the chance to talk to people like yourself, you know, who, who've 
had the opportunity to play in the sandbox of Alien, just to ask them about the first time you know they ever encountered our favourite acid-blooded psychosexual monster. So, do you remember your first encounter with the series? Yeah, absolutely. I was 1986, if I recall correctly, and I was in a movie theater with my high school buddy Daniel Baker, and we watched Aliens in the theater. And I had, of course, I was familiar with Alien, but I had never seen it. Um, and we, so my first hardcore exposure was Aliens in the theater, and it completely blew me away. It, to this day, it remains, in my opinion, the best movie ever made, all genre, all category. I'll put it up against anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've just been absolutely in love with the franchise ever since then. You know, a lot of people tend to come in through it through Aliens. Um, this is really interesting. Um, and it works. It works as an entry so well. So, yeah. Um, so Ali Aliens would be your favorite then? Yeah, by far. Aliens is my favorite. Um, I, I, Alien is a, a close second. They're, I think they're, they're magic in that they take completely different approaches to a very similar concept. We go from, you know, a haunted house in space to a full-fledged battle uh, on a, and it, it's a multi-character arc. It, it's just a different ways to look at the same thing. So in that, as a storyteller, watching people approach that Cameron and Scott approach that from two different directions is pretty fantastic. I like almost everything I see in the, in the space to varying degrees. Um, a lot of it frustrates me quite a bit, but, you know, it's like the pizza scale. The worst Aliens movie is still pretty cool. Well, going off that then, um, what is your least favorite and why? I think Prometheus is my least favorite. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff. If you really dive down deep in like the Dark Horse stuff, there's some stories that they had to go somewhere. They had to be creative and try and take things in a different direction. So they try a bunch of different stuff. But Prometheus was really, really odd in its approach and changing the kind of changing the history and shifting everything mm. around from a universe that was, had created so much fandom and was, was pretty well defined. So I think that was my least favorite of them because I was so excited for it, saw it theater and opening night and was just so disappointed. In, in, this is a different, it was a different, Scott took a different approach to it than what we had seen before. Um, and that's cool. And a lot of people really adore that movie. The other single biggest disappointment of the whole franchise was Aliens 3, the beginning of Aliens 3, where they killed Newt. And not even she doesn't even get a good death scene. She's just dead. And for a franchise that has struggled ever since to find another, uh, you know, kind of dynamic, powerful female lead to, to carry the franchise, from a storytelling perspective, getting rid of the one character who would have an endless built-in motivation to find these things and kill them wherever they are was a big bummer. So those are the, those are the two big things that I feel like the, the lower end of the awesomeness that is Aliens. Okay. What, what about the rest of the feel of Alien 3, though? I mean, especially given, you know, how you present the aliens in, in Phalanx and that sort of um, endless dread tone of Alien 3. I mean, did, does that work for you? <laughs> It, it worked on a lot of levels for me. I'm, you know, obviously a fan of Fincher, and, uh, and, and there's so much in that movie that's good. Uh, getting a different take on the biology. Um, as a diehard science nerd watching the, you know, the, the dog version, and although it was very sad to watch that puppy in pain, that's always difficult yeah. to watch. But to, to see the different form of the alien come out and like, oh, that – that answers a lot of just seeing that picture answers an enormous amount of questions from an evolutionary point of view and an adaptability point of view. So, so much of that was, was very cool. Uh, there's parts of that movie that did not hold up for me. I, and I don't know if that's, if I watched the movie on its own, uh, that it probably would have been a very different experience, but coming in after alien and aliens and just being crazy for aliens to watch how they went about telling the story there, there were some things that were a bit of a letdown for me. But I, I really like it. Sigourney Weaver is pretty cool in it. Takes a lot of logical leaps with uh, the face huggers, uh, how they got into the ship, etc. Mm. But uh, if you if you take some of those things in stride, it's still it's really fun. Yeah, you, you have to with Alien Three. Mm -hmm. You do. So we have a, a long-standing, friendly argument, but an argument nonetheless within the community revolving around H.R. Giger's original Alien design. 
Mm -hmm. And that's whether we prefer the head with the human skull visible or not. Now, I'm always curious about how creatives involved in the franchise feel about this. Do you have a preference? I prefer it not visible. Um, and I, if I recall correctly, they intentionally made some changes in that and somewhere during the initial production run um, to make it scarier with no eyes and not even eye sockets or anything like that. So in my first hardcore exposure being aliens, I tend to favor that style of the creature the over... Ridged. Yeah, the, the ridge head. Um, but it's it's cooler without that. And it what I've learned from working with Fox, both on Dangerous Prey and Phalanx, is leaving stuff unexplained and leaving things to be mysterious can really expound your storytelling possibilities and keeps it can keep the reader or the viewer on edge. So can they see? We don't know. Can they smell? We don't know. I mean, with the way their head is structured, there's a lot of things we don't know just by looking at them. And that that creates more more fright and more mystery. I mean, you've got a bipedal creature that moves around basically like we do. You got to put something in there to spice it up. So I prefer no eyes, no skull inside. Okay, that's another victory <laughs> to uh, to the, the the no skulls. That's that's the overriding opinion, and uh, I'm on the losing end of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, given. The Cold Forge and Labyrinth's connections in Phalanx. I'm assuming you've had some exposure to the expanded universe, um, but d just how much have um, you know? Have you been involved with that? Though, have you read like lots of the um, the older comics, lots of the um, other novels, or anything like that? Or is it more just like a toe dipping kind of thing? Um, it, there's. I actually worked with Alex White on Phalanx to try and make sure it was as coordinated as it could be with Cold Forge. I've known Alex for a long time. Uh, and I loved Cold Forge, and both of us, as fans of the franchise, were, were trying to find, how do we get more continuity in this? How do we get a couple of Easter eggs in there so that people who've read Cold Forge, then happen to read Phalanx, aren't, skew, you know, don't, it's not like a car crash of expectations and what this animal can and cannot do. So it worked with them there, and then I thought I knew a lot about the aliens <laughs> universe until I started writing this book and found out I'm horribly uneducated. There's so much knowledge out there. Um, you know, AVP, the, the, the site, um, Alien Theory was a great, the video, the YouTube show was a great source of research for me. Um, being able to, uh, email various experts in the aliens world who just knew a lot of stuff and uh, new stuff that was canon and also knew when to say, well, they don't, they don't really explain this part. So you should feel free to do whatever you want to right here. It was awesome. It was a great sense of community, and I know there, I've gotten a lot of new comics and books to read based on that. So it worked as closely as I could with a lot of people. Some things aren't nailed down by Fox, so it's it's up in the air. And Titan Titan's basic interest is to create the best story possible in that situation. So Steve Saffel at Titan is my editor, and Titan's not really worried about hardcore continuity all that much. They also they don't have clear marching orders on what is continuity. You know, it's like, is Aliens versus Predator continuity? Sometimes, sometimes not. Aliens yeah. 3, most of the time, sometimes not. So finding that out was a shock to me that like, wait a minute, you guys should be, you guys should be able to give me a list of stuff to watch and read that is canonical. And they couldn't do it largely because of uh, Covenant and Prometheus and the different direction things had taken. Yeah, because what, what Scott does at the end of that could change so much. Yeah, yeah. It could change so much. Um, if you're after recommendations, Destroy an Angel's Apocalypse. That's Prometheus done properly. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, like we've already mentioned, you know, before working on Phalanx, you contributed the short story Dangerous Prey to Bug Hunt, the, the anthology uh, book. How did you become involved with Bug Hunt? I'm friends with Jonathan Mayberry, who's a fantastic author. Um, he is the author of the V Wars series, which uh, is out, out on Netflix right now. It was originally a comic book and novel series. So I'd written in that world for him. He reached out initially, before V Wars blew up, he reached out for people like, hey, I'm writing these vampire-based short story anthology. Would you like to be in it? And having read his work in the comic, I was all in. So I worked on that with him and I've seen him at various cons and we, you know, we email and have lunch every now and then and talk shop. And then he, so he knew what a huge Aliens fan I was. And when he got the opportunity to edit Aliens Bug Hunt, he reached out and I was super excited. 
but I wanted to do something different for that. So I, we had to get permission from Fox to write the first aliens POV only story. There's no human character point of view at all in um, Dangerous Prey, and you get to see it really from the the inside view. What's going on in um, in the Xenomorphs' heads? If they if you, if you think they have brains or not, or thoughts or not, that kind of gets answered in that story. So that's how I wound up getting into that anthology. Why did you go down the POV route? I mean, it, it's something that some of the EU's flirted with a little bit. But mm -hmm. nobody's ever done that before, you know, like you said, nobody's ever gone full POV. Um, but why that road? And, and was it much of a challenge in terms of getting yourself in that headspace? The real reason to go down that was some of the little the little things they put into aliens in particular, like how could they cut the fucking power man? They're animals, you know, like when as soon as you see the aliens use a form of tactics, it changed Everything was a pivotal moment in the movie, even though they didn't expound on that all that much. You have to sit there, and if you are a fan of biology and entomology, you have to look at it like, okay, how did how did that happen? How did that decision get made? How much can they think? What can they what can they do? What they can't do? So it, it always been in my head that I always wanted to see more of it explained from their perspective. How do they operate as such a tight pack? How do they know when to press the attack? Uh, when to walk away, like the the robotic guns in the deleted scenes of Aliens. At some point, there's a measurement system that they have where they've lost enough now that they just have to leave that alone and find another way in. So those open-ended questions led me to want to see things from the Aliens POV. And Fox was pretty cool that they were they wanted to be clear, like they they do not have human thoughts. We're not going to put that in there at all. So then that became the challenge of how to do that and worked with um, two biology PhDs and an en entomology and a guy who served three terms in uh, Desert Storm, who's a consultant for me for weapons and small unit tactics and all things military. So getting both the insectile, eusocial, hive animal perspective on how this might work combined with actual proven tactics for how uh, troops work silently with just hand signals and gestures and communication, putting those two things together, it, to me, answered a ton of questions about how the aliens did all this stuff they did. What is the secretion for? Why do they put the stuff up all, all over the walls, every, the, the hive material that they make? Getting to answer a lot of those questions helped a ton. Even getting into why is the head so long and what is, how do the pharyngeal jaws work? I answered pretty much every question there is in it. And then Fox came in and it's like, okay, here's 10 things you're not going to talk about. Just delete this from this story. <laughs> they, they don't want it completely defined. They don't want it under a microscope. They want that mystery to be there, which of course, initially I was very resistant to, but after, after two or three email exchanges, I started to see their way of thinking and understanding why they want that flexibility for future stories in the space. So, um, was it a challenge, do you think? You know, was, was that a hard sort of um, short to write? It wasn't. I Honestly, I've been waiting to write something like that since I was a teenager. So it was great. And I'm a, a big bug fan, the regular bugs, not the xenomorph kind. So, so I've always had a lot of theories on how the stuff I had seen in Alien and Aliens and, and the rest of the movies and, and the books, how that could actually work. What is the mechanisms behind the behavior of the xenomorphs? So no, it was, it, the only real challenge was trying to get as much real science into it as possible. So the research and talking to the experts and trying to explain these things that we saw, that part was challenging. Uh, the other challenging part was, you know, finding out from Fox, like, great, you've explained everything. We don't want you to explain this stuff. We want to keep it a mystery. That was very challenging because a lot of work had gone into that. And I know that there are you know, millions of other Aliens fans would want to see a plausible explanation for that, that covers a lot of the behaviors we've seen. Other than those two things, it wasn't challenging at all. It was in incredibly exciting to know I was writing an official Alien story. It, I've, My own writing career has gone pretty well. I've got my own properties out there. I've always kind of done my own thing. But as a hardcore fanboy of that universe, knowing my name was going to be in an official Aliens book was awesome. Yeah, yeah I get that. Um, so let's talk phalanx then. You know, um, how did you get involved with that story? Was was it? Were you offered a chance to pitch after your work um, on Bug Hunt? Yeah, Bug Hunt went pretty well, and uh, as I understand it, the people at Fox were very pleased with the story. 
And a lot of that also is, you know, if you're if you're in an anthology for somebody else's property, it's sort of it can sort of be an audition for like a trial how, run. How easy is this person to work with? Do they take direction well? Because it's not their universe; it's ours. Do they get their stories in on time? Do they get their edits back on time? There's a lot of small parameters by which they sort of create this pool. Of, well, we're interested in working with her and him and her, and then they tell Titan to to go look into it. And Steve Sapple at Titan, who worked on Bug Hunt, so I f was familiar with him from that. Then he uh, he reached out to me, knowing we were both going to be at Dragon Con in Atlanta, and want to sit down and talk about it. And basically said, if you want to pitch an alien story, go ahead. So I wrote ten pitches for him for different novels. Um, for various reasons, we boiled that down to five, and then I did you know, like a five or six page treatment on all five potential novels. And he gravitated towards Phalanx, which at the time I was calling Aliens Legion, and then I later changed the name um, to Phalanx to fit the story a bit better. So, and then he and I went to work uh, on that. We pitched the idea to Fox, and they approved. And then we hammered out a good outline, and Fox had approved the outline too. And then once that was done, it was pretty much me and Steve from there on. Were your other pitches also, you know? Um, I don't want to say wildly different, but, um, you know, with Bug Hunt, with, with Phalanx, you know, you seem to have a, um interesting outside-of-the-box kind of things. Were, were your other pitches along the same sort of vein? Yeah, they were all they were all different takes, trying to find a different take on the Aliens universe. Um, a lot, uh, three of them went hardcore into into biology and evolution, where the species might be going. And then one was just kind of a straight heist heist movie where, of course, people get trapped in a horrible haunted house situation, but then trying to do some different things with the creatures, all of which is still in continuity with Alien and Aliens and Aliens 3. <clears throat> so those ideas are still out there. Maybe somebody will get to do something with them someday. But they were all they were all different. It wasn't just... We are trapped in this place with this black monster that is eating us. We have to get to a ship and get away. It was trying to get away from that direction, if at all possible, because it's been done a bunch and a lot of people do it really well. And there's always a new way to, there's always a way to bring new spice to that. Going back again to Cold Forge, uh, finding the, the the cool stuff Alex did to make that a living, breathing, unique property. So they were all all quite a bit different. Okay. I just sort of expect that from you now. You know, if, if you're ever coming back, I, I just yeah that's that's what i'm uh the brood i'm expecting you to go down cool um so now we're going to start talking specifics okay um, if, you, if you've been listening this far and you haven't read pause sod off come back in a bit yes please um, please don't read it and then come back i don't want you to have anything ruined for you because mm, there, there's a lot in this that sort of um i don't want to say hinges on surprise but it works better for the surprise um now, I suppose the big question with Phalanx is, is why? Why did your mind take you to the medieval setting with aliens? It's We've seen so much of modern colonial marines going up against predators, going up against aliens, and uh, it, it it's always a bit of work on the writer's parts for these shows to find out why our people can't stand off at a distance and take out these creatures that don't have any ranged weaponry. And that you, you can see the, the sweat of the writer and all the projects where they have to find a way to justify these close quarters combat and this, this creeping sense of dread. So I wanted to try and get away from that to some extent. And I wanted to get a shit ton more xenomorphs involved. So looking at that and then, you know, when, they're such advanced predators that a a single human against a single xenomorph is guaranteed without without guns there's zero chance it's zero chance of survival so trying to figure out well, what could make humans be able to survive an attack by one or more xenomorphs and that's working in unison and the medieval setting is ideal for that particularly uh, the the phalanx tactic the sumerians and the greeks uh, in different cultures, in the Egyptians, where they were able to change the course of history by just locking shields and working together and being a disciplined, professional-type army. So trying to take that and bring that up against the aliens, if we as human beings were facing 
xenomorph horde? What could we possibly do to survive it if we're a pre-industrial civilization? And that's what I wanted to explore. So um, that sort of leads me on to the next one, which was I wanted to ask you about the research process for, you know, for phalanx. Mm -hmm. Were you already quite knowledgeable about medieval times and the tactics and stuff? Or was this a completely new experience? Kind of a completely new experience. I'm a huge fan of the movie 300. And that was, uh, when you read this book, it's obviously an influence. Um, wanted to see that shield and spear tactic and, and how that might work in the in this situation. But I started to do a lot of research on it and was fortunate to be friends with the author Mike Cole, who's both a science fiction writer and a, midi a, a military historian. And he wrote a book called... Uh, Legion versus Phalanx, or Phalanx versus Legion. I think it's Legion versus Phalanx. Great nonfiction historical look at how these, first how the Phalanx came to fruition in the world's history and what it did militarily, and then going in the big head-to-head -head battles against that tactic up against the Roman Legion, Legion tactic, and was able to learn a ton about how Phalanxes worked and Legions worked and all the, the minuscule detail. You know, how do they carry those giant spears? How do they, how much weight is in the armor? How much weight is in the shields? How far can they march with that weight on them? Why aren't they fully armored? Why are they only partially armored? A lot of those details made their way into the book. And then fortunately, since I've known Mike for like 10 years now, I was able to be DMing him on Twitter all the time. What about this? What about this? What about this? And he was an incredibly patient and gracious guy and answered all the questions because he lives and breathes this stuff every day. And that that was the real source of research research. So I learned quite a bit and relied heavily on the knowledge of Mike to tell me what what was real. And then for the stuff I made up, what would actually work in a close quarters combat situation? Um, was it was it that book that sort of led you down the road of um, the phalanx being the, you know, the, the key tactic for these guys? Then um, did you go into it already knowing that or was it something that you you picked up with the research? It, that's what I started out with the concept of a legion and the um, if I'm Hence the title. It, what's that? Hence the title, the original yeah, title. The original title, but you know the there's I watch pretty much every uh, gladiator type type Roman conquest movie that I can get my hands on, and the Tetsudo, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, where they make kind of a shield, they hold up the shields and make a box so you can't get in there, and it's a way to way to move forces forward under fire. Or protect peop uh, particular people against an attack. Uh, the Eagle is a great movie to see this in action. The um, TV show Rome is another one where you can see this. So that was that's where I started. And then, without getting too much into spoilers, as I researched, I found some other phalanx type type tactics that I thought would make a spectacular vision for the uh, for the battle scenes and the ends of the movie. So that kind of led me militarily kind of regressing in history if you will to go back to the phalanx tactic because it's not just it's not just you know the carthaginians and the sumerians you know, this this tactic has been seen in the swiss pikemen it's been seen in the scots going up against the english in, in some battles so it is a tactic that has reinvented itself numerous times throughout the world's history and i want to see how that that would work and basically that is making an impenetrable armored shield is uh, it's a, a force divider it's a way to eliminate a lot of the strengths that the xenomorphs brought to the table uh, one of my favorite aspects of um, phalanx was the constant pressure of the alien and that's not something that i think gets um, done enough in, in the expanded universe um, even in the way in in your book uh, that it was there you know with the shaping of the culture even if they weren't necessarily on the screen Screen, mm. on the page um you know was was that a conscious decision on your part to keep the aliens always involved because you know it is a struggle in in this context in this setting to keep them there without everybody just dying um, but yeah. the way you did it kept them there all the time and that is uh, in all my work my effort is to be as realistic as possible keeping in mind that i'm introducing incredibly unrealistic situations so trying to be true to trying to be true to military tactics, how soldiers actually operate, trying to make people behave like real people. The analogy I always use is, you know, you watch that movie where the four teenagers go to the haunted house and they're like, let's break into this house and then split up and go to different areas. Like that, 
does not happen. You can do that as lazy storytelling to get people into a situation. But if you try and make it feel real and feel like people like us, that's just not something that we would do. So looking at that, keeping the realistic concept in mind, what happens when uh, xenomorphs get loose on a planet that is not equipped to deal with them and there is nowhere to go? And the answer is obvious, it's gonna be a population explosion. They're gonna just devastate any pre-industrial culture and tear, tear across the whole planet in fairly short order. So you, the phalanx gets into parasitical population expansion and looking at where the limit of that is and also trying to look at, you know, if parasites completely wipe out their hosts, then the parasites on Earth die. In the aliens universe, they just go into hibernation. So there's no limits on how many people they can go out and kill. And you wind up with these survivors that are leading a really hard scrabble existence. They have to hide under the surface in tunnels all the time just to keep from being taken away. And remember the characters in this book have no idea what happens. They just know people either get killed or carried away. They assume they're turned into demons themselves because when a person goes away, more demons show up. So that pressure, yeah, is always there. They constantly have to be on guard. There is no safe place for them. There's no wall behind which they can hide forever. If they get seen by the aliens, they're dead. And maybe not just them, but everybody they know and love. So that constant pressure was a was a storytelling decision I made early, early on. Because of how much that I enjoy Dangerous Prey, and because of how much the concept really intrigued me, you know, I, I went into into Phalanx with pretty high expectations, but no real expectations of what the story would involve. Mm -hmm. And one of those concepts in it that I found I really latched onto was the idea of the runners, and um, particularly. Um, Alia's development revolving around that commitment. Um, was this an aspect of the novel that, that came easy to you while you're working on this? Was this one of those, I know what I'm doing, I know what careers they kind of need to be? Yeah, it, it came pretty early on. We're looking at, um, I think it's seven or eight isolated human um, establishments where they're still surviving and still trying to, still trying to have a, a culture and economy and, and live and eat and, and but not be to caveman status and if you're looking at realistically looking at what might what might happen with a xenomorph population explosion and you have to have some form of trade between these uh, these hobbles or these holds otherwise people are going to start dying off so looking at you know one place might grow this plant that has this particular medicine that deals with this particular disease well if it only grows in this one place they have they have a the power to trade with other holds and get things that they don't have and get an exchange going which as soon as you have an economy you have the ability for greed to step in and start to impact uh, impact the characters in the story and the plot lines but knowing kind of how militaries have always worked in the world, not just American, it, it, everywhere, it's young people are the ones who get recruited or drafted or forced into fighting and killing and dying. And even though there's not a global military fighting against the xenomorphs, I assume basically the same thing goes on, is that the uh, the powerless are pressed into, certain, into the dangerous service. So the concept of teenagers and early 20-somethings uh, having to run from one hole to the other to keep the economy going, keep people alive, seem to make a lot of sense to me. And it also exposes them to the most danger and they're the most physically fit to go out and do these jobs. So a lot of different parameters helped to make that feel really realistic. And I just love that you, um, you made her feel like perhaps she should keep doing it as well. You know, all the concerns around what she wanted to do with her future after that, I, I really, really enjoyed. Um, so, well, yeah. You got to look at it, you know, if you if you and I or anyone watching this is in that situation, um, if you want to just roll over and die because things are, are super stressful, okay, cool, but that's not how we work as a species. And this is the environment that Ahalia has grown up and has never known anything else. So of course, yes, constant danger when she has to go up, her life is at risk more often than not. But she also knows that she is doing a huge service to her people and to human beings in general. So she knows that if she's really good at this, 
she can go out and find uh, medicine that will help her friends and her family bring it back. And she has made people's lives better and kept people alive and kept the whole working. That's a big emphasis in this book is if you can't work, if you can't produce, you're out because it's so hard to come up with everything. So a lot like those same young people who get um, brought into military service, once they're there and find out the realities, a lot of them are like, this is not for me at all. I don't want anything to do with this. But then a lot of other ones are like, this is exactly what I would like to do. I am, I have this job, I'm good at it. I am contributing, I'm providing something to society. So they stay with it. In America, it's, you can stay for your full 20 years and then retire. So looking at, at people I know closely who have chosen to do that, trying to mirror that over to Aliyah's decision, just because she's in danger and her life is at risk all the time doesn't mean what she's doing isn't isn't phenomenal work that helps her people. So she's willing to risk herself for that. Now, something that Phonix did that really surprised me was the alien poison. Mm-hmm. That's something that's only really been done before once in Alien's Labyrinth. Can you tell us about this particular um, story element? <clears throat> well, like I'm sure like a lot of fans, you you Google acid and you research acid and like that's the one there's many brilliant aspects to alien and aliens and the creation of this species but the one thing that stands out above all others is uh, you you can't you can't kill it because it'll kill you if you're too close to it and how that eliminates so many ways that we would try and deal with these creatures so I started to look at that really closely. Is that if you are looking at a medieval situation against the xenomorphs, that's obviously the biggest thing. Yes, they're fast and they're strong and they're deadly. They've got tails, they got teeth. But if you can mass enough people together, you can take them out. Unless when you are in close combat with them and you wound them, that stuff's spraying all over the place. It, it changes, changes the game dramatically. Um, so I was trying to find a way to deal with that. And in the research, finding out what can neutralize this acid, if anything, I wasn't able to find anything specific because the chemistry of the alien blood is not revealed by Fox. And really, nobody knows. They've not defined it. They're not going to define it. They want it to be amorphous and mysterious. So it's like, okay, if you guys can do that, then there's going to be some kind of base compound or some kind of uh, neutralizing agent somewhere out there that's either invented or natural that will take away that advantage. And that we putting that on Adagina, the world the story is set on, is what changes the changes the balance. It it's not completely overpowered. Aliens are still incredibly deadly, but it it does give humans the chance to compete somewhat on even on an even keel. Um, I wasn't aware that was in Labyrinth when I started this. It's it's a concept I'm sure somebody's going to come up with, and poison's a pretty standard concept in a lot of different stories. But finding a way to deal with, or it, it doesn't eliminate the acid, it mitigates the acid. It reduces the effect to some extent. And that in there is an enormous amount of dramatic tension. So you can present just like, it's a lot like watching somebody with a pulse rifle, watching that little counter tick down. As long as you got a pulse rifle and bullets, you're fine, but you're running out of bullets. And eventually you're going to be out, and that's what forces the story forward. And the acid neutralization works a lot like that. Yeah. And well, it didn't help them uh, completely in the end, did it? At least in terms of the uh, the big battle, which was awesome. Um, I did love that you um, massacred so many people, with, <laughs> um, and particularly with the acid, you know. Um, you know. There's plenty of melting skin and uh, limbs and stuff like that. It was something I really love. I love it when the acid's used. Um in interesting ways and in deadly ways. It's 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 challenging when you're writing in this world to find a way to do it because usually, uh, I mean, like an alien gets hit by something big and blows up and acid around the people and I carry the wounded people around with you or the acid only comes into play, like oh, I'm trying to remember which one I, I just read, River of Pain, I think, where the alien's already on top of someone, fight's over, and then the acid just kind of adds insult to injury. But watching, I found a lot of fun writing it, watching people deal with these injuries and, and have to continue fighting and taking care of each other while the acid was doing what the acid does was was pretty gripping. There was some some parts that are actually kind of hard to write because I'm putting, I try and put myself in my character situa- shoes during these stories. And some of this is like, man, what a, what a friggin' nightmare this would be. It'd be awful. Yeah. Was there any particular character that you actually found the most fun to write? I liked uh, Ahalia's 
great because there is, from the perspective, there is gender inequity within the cultures on Adagina, but not every culture. Each hold kind of has been alone for, I think it's 60 or 70 years. So they've all developed their own subcultures and the women are not to be seen and not heard in this culture, but they don't have some of the advantages that men have. Uh, and that's largely because in a medieval situation or pre-industrial civilization, size and strength and aggressiveness matter. And it's going to impact the culture. You look at all of our pre-industrial cultures, very, very, very few have women on any kind of an equal level. But you go to some like Viking cultures uh, and Scandinavian cultures, there's still a huge part of what goes on. Um, a lot of the American Indian cultures as well, they are part of the, they can be part of the fighting force. They're a huge part of what goes on. So trying to find that balance with Ahlia was really fun. My favorite dynamic is Crean and Brandon. Crean being the in, in, game-changing genius that his people aren't smart enough to recognize how smart he is because he is tiny and scrawny and annoying. And in this culture, what is prized more than anything else is big, strong people. P big, strong people who can possibly fight against the xenomorphs or the demons that they show up, but who can enforce the law of the person in charge within a hold. So your, your size and strength and fighting ability are the most prized trait in this culture. And Crean's everybody just listen to Crean and let him do what he does, they'd probably be able to fix all of their problems in pretty short order. But he's largely ignored. So watching his struggle to deal with the fact that he knows more than everybody around him, but nobody's paying attention to him, nobody's listening to him, that was dynamic. And then he's very jealous of Brandon, who's on the other side of the scale. Brandon's not dumb, but he's not brilliant either. He also is the biggest person his age in the hold and is easily on track to become the biggest, strongest person on the planet or in the hold. So he is a prince of sorts. And they're trying to rush him through the part of his mandatory service of running between holds so they can get him into a position where he can be uh, a bully or an influencer or a, a private cop, if you will. Anything along those lines where the people in charge can use him to keep everybody else in line. Brandon doesn't want to be that person at all. Brandon just wants to serve and contribute like Ahalia does, and he respects Ahalia quite a bit. So Brandon is being forced into this role that he doesn't want and doesn't believe in, just like Crean is being forced into a role he doesn't want and doesn't believe in. But their two roles are diametrically opposed. Big and strong, incredible fighter, talented, gifted in that category, uh, not all that smart and knows it, versus brilliant beyond measure, and knows it, but clearly has almost no ability to fight whatsoever. So watching those two interact and their friendship grow under Ali's tutelage was my favorite part of the story. There was a really good character dynamic between everybody there. That, that was probably one of the more fun bits, you know, was um, seeing them all grow from the start because, it, you know, they'd only been running a couple of times together at that point, hadn't they? Mm -hmm. um, you know, seeing all that develop and then split apart and then come back together and then them actually reach their potential, I think, was one of the more satisfying um, elements and elements of Phalanx. Um, so you said with Dangerous Prey that there was stuff you were forced out of. Was mm -hmm. there anything in Phalanx that you wanted to do but ultimately had to be dropped? No, not at all. I, I learned so much from working with Titan and Fox uh, on Dangerous Prey. And like I said before, that's that might have been kind of an audition process for them to some regards. Uh, they getting to see how they worked, how they expected things to be done and learning the rules they had set up for their the creators under their larger umbrella. I took all of that into Phalanx and uh, and I think I got a lot of grace from Fox for the things I wanted to do because of Phalanx and because they saw how well we all worked together. So by the time we got to the outlining stage of Phalanx, I, there was no problems whatsoever. I don't think I got told no on anything. At the same time, I didn't present them with anything I knew they were going to say no to. So it was a great working relationship. You knew how to play the game at that point, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if, if I wanted to do this book and I desperately wanted to do this book, I had to, you know, tip my hat to the people who are in charge of it and control it and understand, like, I'm just, I'm just a guest here. This is their home. If we want to work together, I have to... Check, I have to make sure I'm paying attention to their rules. So um, how did you actually find the experience writing Phalanx? You know, was it a simple process or did the Disney and Fox merger cause any editorial issues? 
there was the, the this Disney Fox merger caused a lot of delays um, and a, a couple of couple of drafts where Titan was waiting for feedback and then they got the feedback and then they would come back to me and like, I know we've been waiting for two months for this feedback. Now that we have it, we need this implemented. Can you have it to me this week? And so, so that was really difficult because we have a lot of diff- I have a lot of different projects going on. I'm working on a book called Mount Fitzroy, which is a sequel to my novel Earth Core. Uh, and as Aliens fans, if you want something that's going to feel like a little bit like Aliens, go check out my book Earth Core. So we, we're in the middle of that. We're in the middle of book six of my Galactic Football League series, which is kind of a sprawling sci-fi. Star Wars meets The Godfather meets Any Given Sunday. So we have all these different things. We had very tight deadlines we're working on. So the the delay from Fox, Disney, Titan, and then the rush, you're like, we got to move on this. Can you get this done? That was really the only dynamic issue that was, was difficult. We had to find ways to work around that. Um, other than that, the process was pretty smooth. Uh, I The first draft, notes coming back from the first drafts weren't all that detailed. And I'm used, I'm used to more, because I've written for Random House for a while. So this is getting used to a new publishing house. But Random House, you get your first draft back and it's like 17 pages of notes and corrections. They, they really go deep in on it. And Titan was not quite as detailed. So I was sort of like, it's sort of like, you know, you're leaning against the door and you're expecting it to be hard to get through. And then someone opens up the door from the other side and you just fall flat on your face. That was like getting the, the first draft notes back. or like, wait, a, there's, you guys are supposed to give me a shopping list of everything that's wrong with this. And they hadn't done that. So I, I had to go through and, and find all those wrong things myself. Uh, and that was, that was difficult for the way that I work. But other than that, it was great. Um, Steve at Titan was great to work with. People at Fox were great to work with. I was honestly quite surprised how smooth everything went. These kind of books tend to be done on a, a quick turnaround. Um, with how much of a beast this thing is in terms of page count, um, how long did it actually take you to do? You know, was it was it a typical sort of like, I think they get it like, what, six weeks normally on these kind of things? Um, how long was your first draft? <sighs> the whole process from... From first talking to Steve until it, until the book comes out is about two years, I believe. Um, I was talking to my business partner about that. She tracks all of the schedules, and I'm I'm not as sure as to what what happened. But the drafts, it it's much larger than most Aliens books, so oh, yeah. I was pushing deadlines or, or missing deadlines um, at, at times, and I know that was very frustrating for. It was very frustrating for Titan and very frustrating for, for Steve because they're also in that phase where they are going to be renegotiating with Disney. If Disney doesn't want Titan, it, that's it. Uh, the, the, that contract is over. So it was important to Titan to get stuff in under the wire to make sure they already had projects to a certain level. So they were insulated against that change. So if they get, if they get dumped, well, they've still got these three, four books and they can count on putting those out. So, the size of the book definitely caused problems. It increased the amount of time it took Steve to get feedback and to read drafts. It increased the amount of time for each draft that I did. And I tried to give them a heads up, but just the way I work, I'm like, this is not gonna come in at 80,000 words. There's no way I can do it. And then, then I'm like, this is not gonna be 100,000 words. This, this, there's stuff that's gotta get done in the story. And, and it, we sort of knew that going in. So I had set it up. I set up part of the reason for the, the plot construct was, well, if we can't get this done or they lose the contract, something like that, I still got a really cool story that I'll go out and put out on my own just without Xenomorphs. We'll come up, we'll, we'll adjust it. So I, I, because of that, I, ha- I was writing longer than I intended to write, but it's got to be done correctly. When you're telling a story like this, I, I, I tried really hard to avoid spots in the book where the reader could see like, oh, I guess he ran out of, I guess he was short on deadline or couldn't cover this or this doesn't make any sense. Trying to make sure everything is logical, contiguous. That all takes a lot of time. With the length of the book, that magnified it. So if that answers your question, about, about, about two years and each draft took about two months. Okay. I mean, the beautiful thing about, you know, the novels anyways, you know, is you're not restricted by your runtime. You're not restricted by um, your budget and stuff like that. So I'm always of the opinion of, I know it's not a realistic one because of the business world and everything, but it takes however long it takes with that kind of stuff. But um, speaking of business decisions, then I don't think this is one you'll be able to explain, but they want uh, people wanted me to ask it anyway. 
Um, so the majority of Titan's original Alien novels have been released under the Alien banner. Mm-hmm. The Phalanx is just one of two that have been released as Aliens. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Do you know why? Yeah, I fought for that. Uh, I Alien to me is indicative of of one primary threat or a small number of of bugs getting into a situation and putting people in jeopardy. And this, since Aliens, the James Cameron movie, is the single biggest influence on my work, my whole career, I'm always drawing from that movie for his style of overlapping t- arcs of tension and a lot of things he did that blew me out of the water when I saw it in the theater. But I, I felt it was important to, uh, to pay homage to that and to send a signal to the reader like, yeah, this isn't one or two or three aliens. There is a shit ton of these things. It's much, much closer to aliens. So this is military horror fantasy is what I think Phalanx is, whereas aliens was military sci-fi. Alien, the singular, the singular aliens, that's sci-fi horror. There's no question what that genre is. But when you introduce the larger units involved in aliens, it becomes more of a, a military thriller type movie. So that was me pushing really hard for that, wanting to, to send a signal. And initially, Titan was like, ah, we do these as alien. I, I, I wouldn't say I was a pain in the ass, but I asked many, many times if this could be aliens. And then Steve was able to get that pushed through for us. Okay, fair enough. So you could explain that one. That's fair enough. Would you be interested in returning to write another alien novel, perhaps the story of the Nanshan? Uh, it, it would be, it would be fun to go in and write some more stuff. Uh, I have this horrible habit of doing that with my work is I kind of put you in the middle of a story and I tell a complete story, the beginning, middle and end, but you, there's stuff leading up to it. that If I do it, the job, right, the reader would love to know that story. And then the reader would love to know what comes after that. So I would, at some point in the future, I would consider writing another aliens book, but right now we have, so much on our own plate and, and series to get books out for that I can't see that happening anytime soon. Ah, fair enough. That's a shame. Come back but, at some point, please. Well, the one way they could pull me out of retirement is if I could get Fox to say, you know what, Aliens 3 never really happened and Newt's alive. If I got a chance to write well, a, a canonical Newt story, that would be hard to pass up. Well, given the how interested they seem in exploring the what ifs at the minute you could probably get away with that i mean we've got all the um the adaptations of uh, the other scripts you know the at the minute they're doing the original uh, dan o'bannon's alien they've just done um two adaptations of william gibson's mm-hmm. second draft yes it was his second draft not his first because his first is batshit crazy um so i i think that the kind of thing would be um of interest to them if you were to uh, suggest it, it might be and they've uh, dark horse did that you know they have the whole, uh, the original uh, ones yeah but they so people have definitely explored that i think other than adaptations of the scripts i think they're still trying to disney slash fox trying to find their way to see are we going to have a defined universe is are things going to be canonical or not and so much i feel like so much is up in the air waiting to see what happens if there is another, if Ridley Scott does another movie, because that is also a giant crapshoot. You have no idea what's going to happen to the established canon when he does another movie. So uh, I I can't imagine them doing that right now. But it would it would it'd be worth it to me if it was in, if it was at all canonical. But it's too much has passed for that to happen. Fair enough. And that is actually everything from me. Um, before we sign off, is there anything you'd like to share? Any anecdote, any thought that I just haven't given you the opportunity to express with any of the questions? Um, I've been on a couple of, of shows and people <clears throat> have expressed interest in seeing this in graphic novel format. And a couple of people are they're like, this would make a, a good movie. So I think that if, if, if your viewers are interested in something like that, Dark Horse has the license right now. Uh, people can social media reach out with Dark Horse, so we'd love to see this as a graphic novel. That could be fun. I, I kind of want to start a, a grassroots campaign for this to get turned into a movie. I would get nothing out of it. My contract is, is completely done. But looking at all the, the controversy between movies one, two, and three, and then where Covenant and Prometheus went, Phalanx is the kind of story that can get told on a more reasonable budget, if you will, 
and doesn't interfere with Ridley Scott's new vision, Ridley Scott's old vision, Jane Cameron's vision. It doesn't interfere with anything. So people should start uh, start asking around and see if we can see this as a movie because it would make everybody happy. So uh, get tweeting, get tagging uh, Disney and the <laughs> Alien Anthology uh, channels in there. Okay. Well, brilliant. Thank you. Um, you know, really appreciate you uh, coming on and um, answering the questions of a nerd uh, on the internet. So it's appreciated. Um, you you shared your socials at the start, didn't you? Yeah, I'll share them again. Uh, yeah. Twitter, Instagram, throw, throw big ones at Scott Sigler. And if you guys are on Facebook, go to facebook.com slash Scott Sigler and check that out there. If you listen to podcasts, go to iTunes or your podcatcher and search for Scott Sigler Audiobooks. I give away free stuff every Sunday. It's a ton of fun. Okay, and if you've come to this through uh, Scott rather than an, an existing listener or viewer of the channel, um, you can find our hub of activity on avpgalaxy.net. We're also on all the socials, um, Facebook and Instagram as Alien versus Predator Galaxy versus as in VS dot. And we're on uh, Twitter as AVP Galaxy, abbreviated. Um, if you want to look at me personally, I'm underscore Corporal Hicks on Twitter. Nowhere else. I don't like to be stalked anywhere else. Just Twitter's fine. Um, because that is always fun. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, this has been uh, Aaron Percival. And this is Scott Sigler signing off.